Well, good morning. I'm so glad you joined us to worship the Lord together. Today we gather on the first day of the week because Jesus Christ rose on the first day of the week. And so we celebrate it. Even though it's not Easter, we still continue to celebrate the resurrected Lord. We might be uh, separated geographically, but we're joined and united spiritually. And so as we gather together today, some of you are waking up, gathering around your TVs, your computers, your iPads, and I'm so glad you took that effort to do that. But as we gather, I want us to declare out loud to ourselves and to the people around us the truth that Jesus is Lord. And so join with me in saying out loud to God and to one another, Jesus is Lord. Join me. Jesus Jesus is is Lord. Lord. Keeping that truth in mind, I'd like us to look at the passage in Philippians 2, where Paul talks about Jesus. I'm going to read uh, verses 8 through 11. And being found in appearance of a man, Christ humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place, And he gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. You see, today we gather in Jesus' name, and we acknowledge collectively that Jesus Christ is Lord.
Amen. Isn't that true? That really all we do have is Christ. The only thing that we have that we can truly rely upon. I, I would say that it's been true in our day that many of us are recognizing the things that we found our securities in, our significance in, those things, are, we see the erosion of that foundation. And we recognize that the only principle, the only thing that is true forever is Christ. He is a living hope. He is true for all ages, for now and for eternity. And so we have our friends Justin and Natalie who recorded this track a couple weeks ago. They'd like to share that with you today and I have their permission to share with you this song, Living Hope. Please continue to sing along. Thanks so much.
Good morning. I'd like to start with something fun this morning to start our lesson. So we're gonna put up a picture on the screen and I want you to tell me how many black dots do you see on this picture? Hmm. Actually, there aren't any black dots on that picture, but your eyes were tricked into thinking that there's some black dots there and some of those white lines. Let's try another one. Take a look at this picture and tell me what you see. Does it look like the dots are moving? Try focusing on just one of the dots. Does it stay still? Well, believe it or not, none of the dots are moving. Our brains just think they are because of the way the picture was created. Now these pictures are called optical illusions and our eyes and brains are tricked into thinking something's there or doing something that it's not really doing. Now today we're gonna to learn about a time when God did something pretty miraculous, but it wasn't a trick, it wasn't an optical illusion, and it certainly wasn't magic. It really happened. Now to review, on Sunday mornings we've started studying the Old Testament, okay? And uh, we're at the point now where Moses has died after leading his people through the wilderness. Joshua has taken over as the leader of the Israelites and has led them into the promised land. They've defeated the cities of Jericho and Ai, and they've actually made peace with another neighbor, uh, the city of Gibeon. Okay, so that's where we're at right now in our story, in the Bible. Um, in Joshua 10, we read about a time where the Israelites came to a place that was ruled by five kings. Okay, now they didn't love and worship God and they had heard about um, the Israelites and what they had done. So they were really scared of the Israelites. So the king of Jerusalem called together these other four kings and said, help me attack Gibeon because they have peace with Joshua and the Israelites. Maybe he thought they were a better target, an easier target than the Israelites were. So that's what they decided to do. So they joined their forces with all their armies and set out to fight against Gibeon. Well, when the people of Gibeon found out about this, they were terrified. So what do you think they did? They sent a message to Joshua, okay, and said, help us, save us, all the kings who live in this land are fighting against us. So what do you think Joshua's reaction was? That's right, he heard this and he and his whole army uh, went to help the people of Gibeon. And the Lord had said to Joshua, do not be afraid of the kings, for I have handed them over to you. Not one of them will be able to stand against you. Joshua knew the Lord was on his side and would help them. So Joshua and his men marched all night long, okay, and surprised the king's armies in the morning, okay? And as the Israelites fought, God made the king's armies kind of confused. He even sent down hail to help defeat them, okay? However, the battle was not over yet. And Joshua needed more time before the sun went down that evening to defeat them. So he prayed to God. He said, let the sun stand still over Gibeon and the moon over the valley of Ajalon. So what do you think God did? That's right, God, <laughs> made the sun stand still and the moon stay in one place so that Joshua would have more daylight. Now, in the world of science, we know that the moon and the sun do not move, okay? The earth moves around, okay? And that's why we see the sun and the moon at different times of the day. So what happened was God made the earth slow down enough that Joshua had a whole 24 extra hours of daylight. Can you imagine that? A whole extra day, all right? And it says in verse 14, there has never been a day like this one before or since when the Lord answered such a prayer. Surely the Lord fought for Israel that day, okay? So boys and girls, the Lord made the earth slow down. The creator of the universe did this for Joshua and his army so they could defeat the enemy. Now, think about if God can do that for Joshua, okay, in his faith and his trust and obedience to God, what can, he, what can he do for us? If we are faithful and obedient to the Lord, he can do the same thing for us the same way he did for Joshua.
Good morning. My name is Lee Schaefer, and I'm a second-year elder here at Christian Fellowship Church. On behalf of the elder board and the staff, we want to say thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for your prayers, for your phone calls, for your texts, for your emails of encouragement, and thank you for your faithful giving. Well, the last several months have been interesting and very eventful. All of us are doing things I think that we've never done before. Uh, in fact, at the beginning of this week, I looked at the mirror and I realized my hair was getting very, very long. So I took out some scissors and a clippers and I started gnawing away at this hair. And it's not that my head is really leaning too much to the left, it's just my one set of sideburns is a little longer than the other. You know, and two months ago, if we would have said that we were Zooming, people would have thought we were just going a little too fast down the main street in New Holland. <laughs> well, the elders and staff have been meeting together and we've been Zooming. You know, there are times when you're staring at that little screen, that 15-inch laptop screen, and you're staring at the same people for hours and hours on end. I have flashbacks, flashbacks to the Hollywood Squares and the Brady Bunch. Those of you over 50 will have to tell your children and grandchildren exactly what I mean. Folks, because of the last two months, we know now for sure that the church is not a building, but it's a body of believers. At this time, we'd like to uh, give you a few updates on some items that you should be aware of. First, our youth pastor search. Hey, we have great news. The board has unanimously approved an applicant that we will bring to our church body as soon as we can meet together as a congregation. Second, our associate pastor search. The committee continues to meet, which is very difficult. And guess what? We've received over 50 resumes. The committee has identified several men, and they will continue gathering more information from those men that are selected. Third, the elder and deacon elections. Thanks to everyone who uh, participated in this election, we had 306 ballots, which is absolutely awesome. And the results are as follows. Elders, Jim I. Martin and Rob Musser. Deacons, Merv Nolt, Kevin Rissler, and Brandon Palmer. And fourth, our finances. Thank you so much for your financial support during these incredibly challenging times. Our business manager, Larry Van Etten, has been providing us with weekly updates. And folks, we seek to be good stewards of the resources with which God has blessed us. Year to date, our weekly giving is down about 8% from our projected budget at the beginning of the year. However, our expenses are also down. And because of your faithfulness, our church remains in good financial condition and we have a substantial cash reserve that should buffer us against any unforeseen expenses. And lastly, helping others. As a consequence of this pandemic and the stay-at-home policy that we're all enduring right now, we want to help those who are in financial need. If you or if you know of someone in our church body who is out of work or underemployed, we want to help please contact Pastor Dave Horst for assistance. So during the next several weeks, we want you to continue praying for one another. We want you to continue encouraging one another. Let's build community where we can, and let's impact our world, a world without Christ. We want to leave you with Psalm 46, 1 through 7. God is our refuge and strength, an ever-present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth give way and the mountains fall into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains quake with their surging. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place where the Most High dwells. God is within her. She will not fall. God will help her at a break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice. The earth melts. The Lord Almighty is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen and thank you. As a church, we want to stay connected during this time of social distancing. And please stay in contact with us as pastoral staff using our emails and our cell phones. And the best way to connect with our office staff is using 
uh, the email for the church office. We have a variety of Zoom and gatherings and video presentations this week. We've added a few. In fact, this week we added some ABF Zoom gatherings, uh, Saturday, Sunday. In fact, there's one that's going to be available at 1045 right after this service that I'll be leading. But anyway, to stay on top of all these uh, presentations and these opportunities, please look at our church website, cfcnewholland.org slash updates. That'll keep you updated. Thank you. At this time, let's go before the Heavenly Father and pray. Would you join me? Lord, we are thankful that Jesus Christ conquered the grave and that by his sacrifice, we are able to be forgiven and able to become your sons and your daughters by faith. Thank you for the gift of eternal life in Christ. Help us, Lord, to remember you and to be encouraged and motivated by your unconditional love for all. Lord, I, we want to pray for those who are dealing with large challenges, those exposed to the coronavirus, those who have been hospitalized, those who are dealing with chronic, chronic illness or death. Lord, we pray for medical workers and doctors and first responders. Lord, be gracious to them as they come in close contact with people in need. Lord, help us uh, to be caring and helpful and hopeful during this time uh, so we can be an encouragement. At the same time, help us to be humble enough to share our struggles so that others can encourage us as well as we trying to encourage them. Lord, I pray for those whose jobs have been furloughed, for business owners who've had to temporarily are partially closed down uh, their businesses, Lord. I pray for our youth and our young adults that are missing their peers, the special celebrations and the milestones during this time of social distancing. Help them to not despair, but to turn to you. Lord, I pray for uh, local churches, our missionaries, and local ministries like CrossNet, that they, as they're impacted by this crisis, Lord, may you be gracious to them and providing the resources and the opportunities to share the name of Jesus and share the love of Jesus with others. Lord, help us as a nation to humble ourselves before you. Help us to repent of our sinful ways and to follow your guidance. In your mercy, please provide the resources that we need that we need to have this pandemic stop. We know you can do above and beyond what we're able to ask or think. We thank you for your ever-present uh, help in times of trouble. And Lord, we trust in you, and we, we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, good morning. Welcome back. Believe it or not, it's been a month that we've been doing these services online, and uh, I trust you're enjoying the experience. Uh, it's a little different for me, recording on a Thursday, which is what we need to do to get it ready for Sunday, but appreciate your prayers, appreciate uh, the many encouragements that we're still receiving almost on a daily basis from, from so many of you, and it means a lot to me and the staff to know that uh, what we're doing is ministering to you and encouraging you. I wonder, are you the kind of person that likes to show up early or show up late? I kind of made an observation over time that the older we get, the earlier we tend to be. I don't know why that is. But older folk tend to show up early, and younger folk, maybe because they have kids, tend to show up late. But do you think it's possible to wait for a long, long time and still be early? Is that possible? Sounds like a contradiction, doesn't it? Well, in fact, it's pretty easy to do. About a year ago, my wife and I were invited to an event, and uh, we arrived and discovered that we were the first ones there. And so we waited for several minutes, expecting others to show up. And when they didn't, we started getting a little nervous. And I thought, well, did I get the right location? No, we have the right address. And then I remembered. It wasn't supposed to start for another hour. I had shown up an hour early to this event. Of 
course, my wife wasn't real happy about that, but she forgave me eventually. You know, we fast forward to the present day, and if you're like me, you're looking forward to when this pandemic is going to be behind us and all this social distancing and all the inconveniences that we've had to deal with. And yet, authorities are already warning us that if we jumpstart the process too soon, we could set off another round of this virus, and certainly we don't want to do that. But being early is not only something that we need to be careful of in the physical realm, we especially need to be careful in the spiritual realm. What am I talking about? Well, there's a phrase that perhaps you've heard. It's called already, but not yet. Maybe you've heard that phrase. For example, on the one hand, we are already seated with Christ in the heavenlies. We are already glorified with Christ, according to Paul in Romans chapter 8. And we already have eternal life, which the Lord promises to everyone who trusts in Him. But on the other hand, the reality is we're still in sinful bodies. We're still living in a very sinful environment that's really broken beyond human repair. And so in real time, all of that stuff I just read, it's not really happening experientially yet, although it's still true. And so the temptation for us is maybe like the world to defy the fact that we're not yet there and try to live as if we are already experiencing eternity. We know that uh, the Bible tells, that we, tells us that we are pilgrims, that uh, this is not our home, that we're just passing through. And yet too often, I fear that the way we live our lives and the choices we make, it's almost as if we're going to be here forever. We're not living as those that realize that eternity is yet future and we haven't arrived yet. And so as we anticipate eternity, we must take care that we don't live as if we've already arrived in eternity. But how do we do that? How do we stop showing up early, so to speak, for what God promises us and instead live the kind of life that truly anticipates eternity but does so obediently well in paul's second letter to the corinthians chapter 4 he provides us with many good thoughts and perspectives in this regard so I invite you to if you have a bible handy i hope you do turn with me to second corinthians chapter 4 and i'm going to be reading beginning in verse 7 of that chapter the apostle writes but we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that the surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. I call this an unflattering status. We are described as something that in Paul's day was not very impressive. Uh, a clay pottery was very very common and and these lamps that they use so to speak to to light their way they were very common but they were very cheap and uh, they were almost dif disposables throwaways but the emphasis here is on the fragility the fact that we are fragile that we are breakable that we are not powerful and that's in contrast to the treasure that we have within us and if you go back to verse 6, he tells us what that treasure is. It's Jesus Christ and the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. And we have this treasure, Paul says, in ourselves. And we have the privilege of bearing that treasure, of bringing that treasure to people who are living in darkness. And so the result is when someone comes to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ, all the glory then goes to God because 
who are we really mm -hmm. fragile jars of clay no it's the power and the glory of god that really shines forth as one commentator puts it the beauty of containers made of earth is that their very weakness and baseless and baseness focus attention on god's extraordinary power so this is our status we are fragile jars of clay whose purpose is to declare the glory and the majesty of God in Jesus Christ. But if we are so focused on life now in this world, if our focus is earthly and we don't have the mindset that Paul is describing here, then in a sense we've jumped the gun. We've already tried to step into eternity and we have failed to fulfill a purpose that God has prescribed for us. But to be vessels or jars of clay, which the Lord, uh, which demonstrate His power and His glory, it requires a process that can be painful at times. And Paul describes that as we continue reading in 2 Corinthians. He says, We are afflicted in every way, but not crushed, perplexed, but not driven to despair, persecuted, but not forsaken, struck down, but not destroyed, always carrying in the body the death of Jesus, so that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always being given over to death for Jesus' sake, so that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So, death is at work in us, but life in you. Did you hear about the guy that's addicted to brake fluid? He says he can stop at any time. Yeah, bad joke, right? <laughs> Well, you know, reading this passage, you'd almost think that Paul was addicted to pain, right? With all the things that he was suffering. He says he was afflicted, and he was perplexed, and he was persecuted, and he was struck down. Wow, was that in the fine print when Jesus signed him up to be an apostle? Yes, it was. In fact, Jesus told him, at the very beginning, when he called him on the road to Damascus, that he would suffer many things for the name of Jesus Christ. But thankfully, he says, even though all those things happened, he was not utterly crushed. He was not utterly despondent. He was not forsaken or destroyed. Why not? Because this was all of God's design. This was part of of the process that God intended to hone Paul, to make him in the image that he wanted him to be as he takes these fragile jars of clay that we are and uses them for his glory in the name of Jesus. And he says in verses 10 and 11 that we experience actually the death, the very death of Jesus. Why? So that the life, the life of Jesus might be manifest in our lives in our lives and furthermore he says this is the way that Christ comes to life as we die for Christ then others who are in our sphere of influence are made alive in Christ through our witness of course not all of us are going to experience the depth of the hardship and, and difficulty that, that Paul himself experienced. We hopefully will not suffer a martyr's death like Paul did and, and many did in the early church. But if we are truly obedient to Christ in the manner that he desires, then yes, there are going to be challenges. There are going to be difficulties. There are going to be hardships. There'll be times when we're perplexed like Paul was or confused. There'll be times when we're despondent or depressed or maybe even feeling as if God 
in some way has abandoned us. And yet knowing, knowing ahead of time that such experiences are really part of the process that God is using can, can make it easier, perhaps, for us to go through such difficult times. doesn't mean they'll be easier, but it'll make it easier for us to bear them. On the other hand, if we are so focused on this life, so fixated on maximizing our enjoyment of earthly pleasures and what this world has to offer to the neglect or even the exclusion of what God intends for us in Christ, then again we are jumping the gun on eternity. We are prematurely and disobediently doing something that has not yet been intended for us. C.S. Lewis wrote a famous book, Mere Christianity. And in that book, he gives us this perspective. He says, Christ says, give me all. I don't want so much of your time and so much of your money and so much of your work. I want you. I have not come to torment your natural self, but to kill it. No half measures are any good. I don't want to cut off a branch here and a branch there. I want to have the whole tree down. I don't want to drill the tooth or crown it or stop it, but have it out. Hand over the whole natural self, all the desires which you think are innocent, as well as the ones you think are wicked, the whole outfit, and I will give you a new self instead. In fact, I will give you myself. My own will shall become yours. I wonder, does that attitude describe you this morning? Does that perspective of life inform how you make decisions, how you make choices, how you live your life day to day before Jesus Christ? So, what is the evidence What is the evidence that we have such an attitude? That we are patiently and obediently waiting for God's timing in eternity? Well, I want to suggest three things, and they're all based on what Paul tells us in the remaining verses in this chapter. And the first is this, a confident faith. Look at verse 13. Since we have the same spirit of faith, According to what has been written, I believed, and so I spoke. We also believe, and so we also speak, knowing that he who raised the Lord Jesus will raise us also with Jesus and bring us with you into his presence. In verse 13, Paul quotes from one of the Psalms, Psalm 116, And in that psalm, the psalmist gives praise to God for his deliverance from him in difficulty. And so in the same spirit of faith as the psalmist, Paul also is giving thanks and expressing his faith and his confidence, specifically that the Lord will one day raise him up from the dead along with all those to whom he has ministered. Because God has already done so in Christ. That's why Paul is so confident. He's already shown this resurrection power through the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, likewise, we who have trusted in Christ can be confident as well that someday Jesus will come to the lower clouds, the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain, the apostle tells us in 1 Thessalonians 4, will be caught up together with them to meet the Lord in the air, and so we will ever be with the Lord. Do you have that confidence this morning? I know there's a lot of fear right now over this this pandemic, and people are naturally being careful. That makes sense. But in another sense, as Christians, we don't have to fear like the world. We know even if we were struck down by this virus, that that is just the beginning 
that we have a home, an eternal home with the Lord and a body that He has prepared for us someday. So despite all the trials and frustrations that we may experience in life, all the hardships and difficulties, we can endure because we have this a confident faith in the Lord. Second thing that we can show forth our evidence of, of being obedient to the Lord and waiting patiently for Him is that we have a, a thankful spirit. Look at verse 15. For it is all for your sake, so that as grace extends to more and more people, it may increase thanksgiving to the glory of God. We know, we know that our hearts and minds are truly being transformed by the Lord when we can give thanks in all circumstances of life. That doesn't mean we thank God for the circumstance necessarily. The circumstance may be very painful, as we are all experiencing right now together. But in that circumstance, we can be thankful. Why? Because again, we know that God is in control. That things don't happen in this world by random or by luck. Rather, they happen according to God's purpose and plan. And experiencing, experiencing God's grace in the midst of a very difficult circumstance can make us extremely thankful. And then finally, a third evidence is an eternal perspective, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart. Though our outward self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light, momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison as we look not to the things that are seen but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient but the things that are unseen are eternal. It's not fully evident to us, is it, right now? What we will be like in eternity, what eternal will be like, it's going to be unimaginable. And right now, we don't know what God's purposes are for specific things that we suffer, although we know and we have confidence that He has a plan and a purpose. But for that very reason, we need to focus on the fact that what we're experiencing is just temporary. It's not going to last forever. We need to live with the eternal perspective that we're just passing through and there are far, far greater things in store for us in the future. Paul talks about endurance in two ways in this passage. He talks about endurance producing an inward transformation of our hearts and character. Notice in some of the other versions that you might have, he talks about our outward self wasting away or decaying or perishing. These are not pleasant images, of course. But the upside, he says, is that our inner self, our inner man is being renewed, is being progressively refreshed on a daily basis. As one commentator puts it, as our outward life conforms ever more closely to the crucified Christ, our inward life conforms ever more closely to the glorified Christ. What a contrast that perspective is to those in our world who don't know Christ, who place so much emphasis on the outward. Now, I'm not saying you should, should play no, shouldn't play any emphasis on the outward. Fortunately for you, I didn't come today in my pajamas, which apparently many are accustomed to be doing these days as they stay home. We do need to pay attention to the outward. It is important, but it's not nearly as important as what God is trying to do inwardly in our lives. And so as we go through this process, there is a dying, there is a painful experience of dying to self. But we need to be careful here. As Paul talks about wasting away or perishing, 
He's not talking about the natural process of dying. That certainly is happening to everyone regardless of their attitude. No, what he's referring to here in context is what happens to us in the service of Christ. As we give ourselves to Jesus, as Paul has described earlier in these verses, there's going to be pain. But it's worth it, Paul says. It's worth it. And the reason it's worth it is he says that someday endurance is going to produce an eternal reward. Yes, our afflictions right now, they may not seem so light. They may not seem so momentary. And some people have to endure trials and difficulties for years and even decades. I don't understand all of that, but God has a purpose and plan, and we need to rest on His wisdom and His goodness. But someday, he says, someday enduring for the sake of Jesus, bringing glory to Him, allowing His life to shine forth as we die. He says it's going to transform itself into an eternal weight of of glory, something that's going to last for all eternity. I know exactly what that's going to be. I think it's going to be far more than just a trophy on the uh, celestial shelf in your, in your mansion, but it's going to be something far beyond we can imagine. This eternal weight of glory is going to accrue to us because of our obedience here on earth. As Paul puts it in the book of Romans chapter 8, for where I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us. And so there's a challenge here for us, isn't it? A challenge to keep our focus on the eternal, not living as if we're already in eternity, but keeping a focus on eternity to help us to bear with what we are experiencing here on earth as part of the process that God intends for us. So what, what would it look like? What would it look like in practical terms for us to be living in this way? I want to suggest four things. Number one, I believe we confront and confess sin instead of coddling it or concealing it. Why? Because unrepentant sin does not allow us to serve the Lord in any shape or form. Secondly, we would seek to serve and to share instead of seeking to be served and to hoard. A lot of that going on right now, isn't there? Because people are thinking only of themselves. Number three, we would die to self for God's glory instead of living for self, for personal gain. And then fourthly, trusting God for the sake of eternal blessing rather than ignoring God for the sake of temporal comfort. As you look at this list, what are some negative and sinful behaviors that you're most aware of in your own life? And then what is the corresponding positive and Christ-honoring behavior that you can begin to pursue, even today. Don't wait till tomorrow. Start pursuing it today. Start allowing God to work those Christ-like graces in your life today. And remember this, this type of lifestyle uh, change, it's not something that comes from the outside. It has to come from within from our hearts. And so ask God, Lord, change my heart. Give me that desire to want to honor you, to endure, to, to not live comfortably in the present as if I'm already in eternity, but rather to live in obedience to you, bearing with whatever pain and sacrifice that obedience may bring. Of course, we can not only 
be guilty of showing up early, we can also be guilty of showing up late, right? And sometimes being late can also be harmful to us. I read an article recently written by an Italian journalist who reflected on the initial failure of Italians to respond to the COVID-19 pandemic. And he says this, I and many other Italians just did not see the need to change our routines for a threat that we could not see. He says even though he had a lot of knowledge about this virus, he didn't have what he calls moral knowledge, a knowledge that in fact impacts his lifestyle and makes changes in his choices. And you know, in the same way, many Christians have a biblical knowledge of who Jesus is and what he desires from us. And yet, unfortunately, all that knowledge doesn't seem to make a whole lot of difference in the way they choose to live their lives. From the outside, their lives, in many respects, look no differently than the lives of their unchurched or unsaved neighbors. James says this, Be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. A lot of people have said recently they believe that uh, this pandemic is a wake-up call. Wake-up call especially for the church. I hope so. But you know, once it's over, Are we going to go back to our own ways, our old ways? Are we going to go back to the way life was before? In many respects, life will probably be different for everyone. But I certainly hope that if we respond in the way God wants us to respond, that when this is over, that we don't go back to the same old, same old, but rather we would renew our commitment to live life now in light of eternity trusting the Lord each step of the way. Let's pray. Lord, what an exciting but also challenging passage this is. We admire the person of Paul who sacrificed so much for the sake of Jesus, and yet he himself said it's just light and momentary suffering. It's really nothing compared to the glory of that God has prepared for us. I pray, Lord, for all of us that the knowledge of that glory, the knowledge of what awaits us would sustain us and motivate us even more to live for you till you call us to yourself. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you and have a wonderful week.